Tony, I don't hear you, but we're ready when you are. All right. Thank you, Wendy. As Wendy said, I'm Tony Bergantino. I'm the director of the Wyoming State Climate Office and the Water Resources Data System. I'd like to welcome you all to our third uh, Wyoming Conditions and Outlook presentation, which was put together by my office. And as Wendy said, the U.S. Geological Survey, the National Weather Service, uh, University of Wyoming Extension, and the uh, USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub, uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and the Wyoming State Forestry Division. And today we'll be looking at past and current uh, climate conditions, followed by the surface water situation, uh, look at the weather forecasts and outlooks, weather, uh, water supply, uh, wildfire outlooks, and then we'll wrap it up with uh, letting you know how you can get involved and help us. So this is the U.S. Drought Monitor map as of uh, May 18th, last, uh, this Tuesday. It's a weekly product that spans through each Tuesday, and this one was just released this morning. There's about a two-day uh, release between when the data are valid and when the map is released. And let me speak first a little bit about the makeup of the drought monitor. It's based on uh, several indicators, such as precipitation, soil moisture, stream flow, and a host of others. And the indicators are all evaluated in terms of a percentile rather than a percent of average. And those percentiles are different from percentages in that they are bounded between zero and 100 with 50 being you know, right in the middle of the median value. Uh, percentile ranking tells you where a value falls in relation to the other observed values. So if you're, if you're looking at the 50th percentile of the median value, you're right in the middle of all the observed values. Uh, a value at the 20th percentile would mean that 20% of the values that have been observed were lower than that value, or another way of looking at it is that value is less than 80% of all the other values. Uh, again, if you were at the 10th percentile, that means you were lower than 90% of the observed values, and, and so forth down there. So here in the upper right, you can see some of the percentiles that go into and define the various levels of drought. One way of looking at these uh, is in terms of a probability of occurrence. So if you're looking at D4, it's, you know, you're in the second or less percentile, which means this is something you should expect to see on average, you know, once every uh, few years. Uh, if you look at the map over here, you can see the current conditions. Uh, this area over in here went from D1 or the moderate drought to severe drought. A large area of the state here was improved. We had, uh, uh, extreme drought in this area here on the uh, Natrona carbon line, which uh, was improved to D2. And then inside here, several of the areas went up one category. And Tony, it looks like you are muted. We lost you for a moment and we've lost your um, screen share. All right, if we're back, uh, not yep, sure we where I dropped off, but uh, I was ending up saying that we still have this little bit of extreme uh, drought down in the south central part of the state in, uh, in the southern Carbon County going over into Sweetwater County a little bit. This is the 14 day precipitation total as a percentile again. And you can see we're down in the very dry area up in here in this, uh, well, actually the whole western portion of the state with uh, the northwestern portion being uh, even more so. Um, Sweetwater County is a little bit above uh, the median and this is southeastern Wyoming here. And then this whole area up in here, except for the, the higher elevations of the Bighorn is uh, below the median as well. Looking at the same map where this is looking at a 90 day period rather than the 14 day. And you can see this area here in the west is, is even worse extending further to the south. So we've had even longer term uh, precipitation deficit here. This area down here in the south central part of the state, which was showing up still as the D3, has been, has been there for, for several months. And then up here in the north uh, east part of the state, we have uh, gained about the same, same conditions as over here in, in the western part of the state. 
large area here, right about the median, uh, Fremont County, and then down in the southeast, we're, we're still above median. Uh, although a lot of that is still some residual showing up from some of the more earlier precipitation when you go back looking at the 90 days. Now, this is the standardized precipitation index. Uh, it's another way of looking at precipitation. It takes a precipitation total over time and then uh, fits it to a normal probability distribution and then calculates the number of uh, standard deviations that a total is from the climatological mean for that period. So your values center around zero as neutral with positive values being wet and negative values being dry. And this map here is showing 30, 60, and 90 day um, time periods for that standardized precipitation index. You can see some of the areas standing out here, like out here in the, in the southeast on, on all time scales, where we went from uh, D0 here in the last little bit down to actually no drought appearing on the map. This area here in the central part of the state where there was an improvement is also showing up fairly wet. A uh, little bit of dryness still showing up here, but that area remained D1 this, this last time on the map. And then the area over here in the west and uh, the northeast, which is uh, going into D2, this area up here in the northeast is expanding in terms of area, not necessarily intensity, although the area of the intensity is expanding. We're getting out over here into Johnson County, down into, into Converse and uh, Niagara Brewer over in here. Now let's look at something a little bit different from what I usually show. Since we're getting into this time of the year where we're also looking at some of the vegetation and crops, this is the standardized precipitation evapotranspiration index. And this is a lot like the SPI. Uh, it's set up mostly the same way, but it goes one step further and also takes into account the, uh, the atmospheric demand for moisture. It basically includes uh, how thirsty the atmosphere is, and that gives you an idea of what the potential evapotranspiration is. And so then those numbers get factored in on top of uh, just your straight precipitation. And again, these are showing 30, 60, and 90 days here. And you can see the conditions. Some of the same areas are still popping out, but they're not as critical or not as, as bad as you're seeing when you're just looking at the SPI. And that's because even though your precipitation has been low, your demand for moisture from the atmosphere is not as high as it could be. So the effect of that is mitigated a little bit. And it's the fact that you're seeing yellows here instead of oranges and getting into the reds. Um, you're still seeing some pretty good blues here on the wet side because that's not gonna really affect it as much as you do on the, on the dry side. So you, you do see the same areas showing up as areas of concern or areas that are, are, are wet, but in this case, and only in this case, the intensity of it is, is a little bit less. We'll move on to temperature. This is the, uh, for the last two weeks, this is the minimum average temperature. And you can see we're above average or above uh, freezing for most of the state, except for once you start getting up into the higher elevation here, uh, where you're still getting nighttime lows that are down below freezing. And if you look at this in terms, you know, compared to average or normal, and most of the state was below normal, except for some isolated pockets here off the Bighorns, off the flanks of some of these ranges here, where you're getting you know, up to three degrees above average over the two week period. But by and large, the, the state as a whole was mostly zero to three uh, degrees below normal. Now this is looking at the same thing, but looking at the maximum temperature side of things. And you can see here, the daytime temps are well above, above the freezing mark, or, we're not having any more days where we're, we're, we're not making it above 32. Uh, if you look at the uh, departure from normal, it's a little bit of a different story. It's about half and half. Uh, you got the southwest, west, north central parts of the state are up to three degrees above average for your, your maximum daily temperature over the two week period. And then you have this large area here in the central part of the state, Fremont County, Hot Springs, parts of Washakie, where you're uh, about three degrees below and the, the Eastern Plains as well. Uh, on the far east and especially down here in the Southeast, you're getting areas down here where you're you know, six to nine degrees below normal in the, in the very Southeast part of the state with this band up here going between three and six degrees below normal. Now, this is probably the last time we're gonna be looking at uh, snow water equivalent for 
for a little while. I just wanted to show this where we're at here. Uh, some of the basins are already melted out. Uh, you know, we have no numbers here. These asterisks indicate that uh, conditions are not necessarily representative of what's going on on the ground. And so you take some of these numbers with a grain of salt. I mean, you can fluctuate daily by quite a few percentage points just with, by having an inch or so of melt out. And this is a little bit different from what I normally show. Again, this is just showing how much actual uh, snow water equivalent is left up in the up in the high country. You have the, the Tetons here being about the only spot above uh, 30 inches of water still. And like I say, some of, some of the higher elevations, you still have a fair amount of water, but you can see as you come down the slopes that that amount drops down, down considerably. And this is why you can see where those numbers become a little meaningless. Uh, for example, the uh, East Rim Divide snow tail in the Green River is, is at 0.1 inches of snow water equivalent, and the normal is half an inch. So it's showing up as 20% uh, of normal, but you're only talking uh, you know, four tenths of an inch. And similarly, Reno Hill in uh, the Lower North Platte uh, this morning was at 7.4 uh, inches of snow water equivalent, and the average or the median is uh, it should be like 3.6 inches. So you're at a little over 200%, but again, the difference is, you know, you're, you're talking three to four inches difference. So that's that's why these numbers start to become, uh, carry, carry less meaning this time of the year. Well, look at snow, uh, soil moisture percentile. Uh, we've had some uh, unimprovements throughout most of the state. Uh, we lost some of the area up here that was in the 40 to 60, you know, right about the median. That's gone, the 30 to 40 is gone as you look over here. Uh, our best range now is about 20 to 30 percent uh, percentile. Uh, we did see a little bit of improvement here in, in Carbon County, which went from the fifth to 10th percentile up to the 10th to 20th percentile, but that's still quite a ways down there. Uh, lost some of the uh, moisture over here in the, the far southwest and this, this whole area here in the west, as well as this area up here in the, in the northeast, actually around here is uh, uh, which is where we were seeing on the map also the uh, uh, precipitation being uh, not as good. You're down into you know, less than the second percentile, which is, is getting really dry. And we'll finish things up here with showing uh, soil moisture, which is one of our, our uh, mesonet stations. This is the one at Sheridan, which is uh, a little bit west or east of Sheridan, uh, showing five depths here from, uh, from five down, five centimeters down to one meter. And you can see going across, uh, you know, the deeper ones here, the, you're not really seeing much of a change in the soil moisture when you get, you know, from 20, 30, or 20 to 50 to a meter. When you get to the more shallow, the uh, 10 centimeter here on the blue, you're starting to get a little bit of a decline. And the five centimeter, you're, you still got a decline, but it's a little bit more pronounced than we were seeing on, at the other levels, which, which makes sense. Just give you a little idea, that station is right around here, sort of in that boundary area between uh, the 10th to 20th and the 5th to 10th percentile. So you can see uh, how, how we're starting to lose that. And if we don't see anything really on top of that, we're going to start seeing some of these uh, deeper areas start to, to decline as well. And with that, I will turn it over to Brian Loving with the USGS to talk about Streamflow. Thanks, Tony, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to talk about uh, how all the information that Tony just presented impacts Streamflow at the monitoring stations that USGS has around the state. Um, first, I'll point out again, even though most of the sites are out of ice, we do still have a few sites around the state that at least at night, as it gets colder, uh, ice forms in the stream and we're unable to report the flow data quite yet. By next month, that should be pretty much gone, but those white sites there um, or kind of light gray. They're sites that still have ice at times, or they could be they could be estimated for another reason. There could be other issues going on. But anyhow, um, last month when we presented this map with the stations, again you can see in the lower right there, uh, green means normal, and by normal it may be a little bit above you know what's the true average for today, or a little bit below, but it's in that range of the 25 to 75 percentile. So half the time it's in the green sites are sites where half the time, historically, the flows are in that range. Um, the 
Last month, we had several sites that were above normal in blue colored dots, and those are all gone now. So we have conditions where sites are either around normal or they are below normal across the state. You kind of see it spread out, and to some degree, it, it kind of the we don't monitor everywhere in the state. Some of the, some places in the state don't have very many streams, obviously. So, uh, but if you kind of think back to the graphs and the maps that you saw that Tony presented, it's the western part of the state is dry. The north central, south central, um, kind of North Platte down there is is pretty dry. The the green dots that you see are on the lower end of normal for most of this map. The the only exceptions are, well, I'll talk about those in a little bit, but. Overall, the, the Green River Basin, Bear River Basin, North Platte, Powder, and Bighorn Basins, they're all below normal. Um, go ahead and advance to the next slide and I'll show a couple of examples here, just singling out uh, first up in the Bighorn Basin, uh, Bighorn River at Basin. Uh, you can see in that graph there on the top right, the blue line are the current daily average flows for about the last month or so. And if you look at the tan line above it, that is the long-term average for those days. So um, we're getting a little bit of snow melt that's, that's started to increase the flows here over the last week, but we're still well below average for this time of year, less than about half, I guess, of what the normal flow would be at this time of year over the last 37 years. Um, moving south down into the Green River Basin, the Green River at Green River or near Green River gauge that we have, it, conditions there are even worse than they are up in the Bighorn Basin. You see there that we have a little gap in the data there, but um, currently the flow is about 700 CFS. That's the mean daily right now. And normally this time of year, it should be closer to 17 or 1800 CFS. So um, about not quite a third, but about, yeah, a third to 40% of what the normal flow should be this time of year in the Green River Basin. All right, another way I wanna show this to you is we'll start off, look at a couple of graphs. These graphs show, and they're complicated. I won't get into a lot of detail here, but they show same colors that we saw in the, in the dot maps earlier, now represented as a graph. And these are the last two years. And so you can see that black solid line. This is for the Green River, near Green River here. Um, last year, we were on the upper end to kind of in the middle of the normal flows throughout the year. Flows were, it was kind of an average year for the Green River at Green River. And then we go into the winter, this previous winter, there's a gap there that's uh, ice affected record that we haven't been able to estimate yet. And when we come out of ice in mid-March, you can see there that we're at the low end of what normal flow is for this time of year. And it just keeps trending down to the point where now we're down kind of in that fifth percentile really low flows as we saw in that previous graph, about a third of what normal flow is for this time of year. Um, and that's that's representative of a lot of sites around the state, especially in those four or five basins I talked about that are drier than normal. If you look to the right, this is one of the few exceptions. So this is Dinwoody Creek. So this drains the upper areas of the Wind River Range in the Wind River Basin. And here, snow melt's happening right, last year we had conditions that were relatively high and it was it's mostly been kind of in the normal range the last during the last couple of years but you can see in the last month or so we've moved up to the we're not in the above normal range but we're at the very high end of the normal range as the snow melts out of the wind river so there are a few places up in the higher elevations in in the ranges where we had pretty good snowpack that are doing pretty well but for the most part streams are are below normal across the state so we're going to move on to talking about the reservoirs now um, with these teacup maps here. And we got the, the, the map on the left are the conditions as of today. And then the map over on the right are a year ago. And first, to kind of talk about things over the last month, even though I don't have that graph up there. Overall, there have been some of the reservoirs have had some small gains in capacity and some have had some small losses, but over Overall, it's a similar volume that's being stored behind reservoirs across the state. Um, statewide, looking at storage volumes from a year ago, we're a little bit lower than we were a year ago. Some of the reservoirs are a little bit higher, some are a little bit lower. Nothing is significantly different, or there aren't many that are significantly different from a year ago. But I would say overall, we have a little bit less um, water being stored behind the impoundments across the state. And that's all I have for covering the rivers. Thanks, Tony.
Thanks, Brian. And next up is uh, Jared Allen with the Weather Service in Cheyenne to talk about forecasts and outlooks. Great, thanks, Tony. Good afternoon, everyone. Jared Allen from the National Weather Service here in Cheyenne. Uh, looking at the overall state there on the left-hand side, actually, for the next seven days, looking at a decent amount of precipitation uh, for the northwestern portions of the state, the higher terrain of the Wind River and Wyoming Mountain Ranges up there through Teton and Park County, uh, where we're going to be looking at a pretty good precipitation event uh, later on this afternoon, uh, through this weekend, and into early next week as well. So kind of a, a semi-unsettled and prolonged uh, pattern that's going to be bringing some precipitation across to the region. Uh, in addition, there is a more rain showers going to be expected across the high plains as well. Uh, there for the north and northeast and north central portions of the state. Uh, so overall, the state does look to pick up some pretty good amounts of liquid water equivalent uh, in, in the higher elevations, especially up there in the northwest part of the state. It does look like it should be cold enough uh, for some snow accumulation, say above eight to 9,000 feet. It might even get a little bit lower at times uh, there on Sunday. But overall, more precipitation across the north half of the state versus the south half, with a little bit less down there towards Sweetwater County, uh, where there could be a little bit less versus the, the higher terrain in there in the southeast, where of recent we've picked up a good amount of precipitation in the southeast, and we'll like to continue to keep that trend going. So if you want to continue on to the next slide, please, Tony. Looking ahead for the next six to 10 day precipitation, kind of up there on the top and then upper right, uh, we're looking at the overall probabilities of what is favored uh, above chances, below chances, or below normal chances. And so for that six to 10 day precipitation outlook from May 24th through the 28th, pretty much across the entire state of Wyoming, we're looking at some type of below normal chances of precipitation being favored. Uh, you have a slightly higher chance of being below normal for that south half or south third or so, which is about 40% likelihood of being below normal. And just you have that slightly higher probability there in Colorado. And then as you go to the north part of the state, you still again have about a 33% chance of seeing below normal rain chances or snow chances as well overall. And then for the temperature outlook, it's kind of a split across the state, west and east, uh, generally equal chances in that no background color right there in the middle. Uh, then further to the left or to the west, you have slightly below normal chances out that direction. And then further to the south and southeast, you have slightly favored above normal temperatures. So kind of a, a wash for the most part of the state uh, from west to east, uh, but the south and southeast will be favored a little bit more for some above normal temperatures across the state of Wyoming in the next uh, six, to day ten, six to 10 day period, which is May 24th through the 28th. And then rolling ahead one more slide, Tony, we're gonna then be looking at the eight to 14 day. So this will kind of bring us through the end of May to the very beginning of June. And unfortunately, we kind of see some of those continued favored components of being below normal uh, across a good portion of the state, at least the, the west half, and then even the southwest there towards you went to county, maybe southern Lincoln County and portions of Sweetwater County, again favored below normal, uh, slightly greater chances in that location. So unfortunately, it looks like over the next six to 10 days and then including the, the two week period out to the very beginning of June, uh, a good portion of the state may unfortunately still continue some trends of being drier uh, out west and on the south side. And I know over the past couple of weeks, it's been a bit dry on the west side too, where some of the drought has uh, worsened a bit as well. So we might be looking at slightly worsening drought conditions where while we can still pick up precip in this time frame, it looks like the, the overall amounts will be below normal. And then switching over to temperatures, on the flip side, we are gonna be a little bit favored for slightly cooler across the north half of the state and maybe even a slightly greater probability or greater chance of 40% likelihood up there towards uh, Teton and Park and portions maybe close to the bighorns of being slightly below normal. So in that case, that should hopefully help the components of, of the evaporation demand and, and how much soil moisture loss occurs uh, and, and should help a little bit uh, with, with those drier conditions. But unfortunately, it looks like drought conditions uh, will persist and, and luckily we'll kind of keep it slightly below normal or equal chances of being near normal temperature wise, uh, but certainly behind the power curve again, as far as the overall amount of 
of moisture and water across the state. So going forward one more. Thanks, Tony. For the Wyoming Snowtail Snapshot, Tony kind of highlighted these a little bit per basin, but these are the actual stations uh, that are located across portions of the state, as you can see. And everything that you see generally in green and blue uh, at some point is larger or has a, a larger amount of snow water equivalent. Uh, but Tony did highlight some of those equivalent measurements can, can be slightly misleading because you're looking at percentages versus actual amounts. But overall, you have a decent amount of, of moisture still residing in the Bighorn Mountains where they've been quite wet over the past several weeks up that direction. They certainly have, are, are kind of on the plus surplus side across the state. If there's any one good area, it's definitely up there in the Bighorns. Outside of that, further to the west and to the northwest parts of the state, uh, as Tony had mentioned, most of those locations are, are melting out really quick or have melted out completely and are certainly below uh, average overall, which was reflected by Brian in what the stream flows were, were looking like in, in many of those areas. And then for the south and southeast areas, there's really only a couple of spots in the very far north Laramie Mountain Range that are still kind of holding on to enough or somewhat of some water, snow water equivalent in the snowpack. Uh, but with the snowies and the Sierra Madres, those are about average or have already really started to melt out as well. So, so pockets of near to above normal for the bighorns and very isolated there in the North Laramie Range. Uh, but elsewhere, uh, we're really looking at well below normal to the majority of the snow being melted out ahead of schedule. And then moving forward one more, I just took a couple snapshots really quick of these snow tell sites, just as an example. So the North Laramie Mountains essentially is around Windy Peak. Uh, you can see the remnants of where we had that really significant blizzard back in March, where we had that huge jump right there. Uh, but we have since uh, melted out pretty significantly and quickly over the past several weeks right there to where it's not carrying too much uh, snow water equivalent at the moment. And then on the bottom one there for the Wind River Range, uh, you can see how very quickly that has dropped over the past week to two weeks. And there in the Wind River Range, and most of the sites in the Wind River Range did not meet or, or reach their average peak snow water equivalent value for the year, which are those green dots. So that green dot is generally the peak time frame and average value for that particular location. So that site and, and many representative sites in the Wind River Range stayed at or below their, their median value. And luckily there in the North Laramie Range, we did exceed that value, uh, basically off that one event that we had in mid-March with the blizzard. Uh, but overall, that, that surplus on the backside tried to help with the limited amount that we had to begin with. So overall, the Southeast part of the state is doing a little bit well, but Portions of central and west are, are still kind of hurting significantly from the, the snow water equivalents really dropping out really quick. And then moving forward one more, Tony. I'll then turn it over to Jim Fahey for the Wyoming Water Supply Outlook. Hi, everyone. This is Jim Fahey. Thanks for having me for this meeting. Uh, first, I just have two slides. First slide is the graphical water supply outlook. I've uh, been doing this for quite a few years for uh, water supply outlook uh, when I was working for the weather service. So continued on. So this is for the rest of uh, the runoff season, uh, May through July. This forecast was made uh, May 1st. And uh, for the state, we're 80% statewide uh, normal, uh, percent of normal uh, water supply uh, runoff volume forecast, you could say. Um, and it follows the forecast uh, different basins follows the amount of snowpack that we have um, in the early May, uh, up in the powder and the tongue. Obviously, they, those areas have more snow uh, than everybody anybody else in the state, so we are looking for above average uh, forecast volumes for the powder and the tongue river basins. Uh, by the way, the red numbers are forecast volumes in thousands of acre feet, if you're wondering, uh, and all the triangles are the all the forecast points for Wyoming. Uh, just continuing on on the uh, general channel of the forecast, um, the other side of the coin of, for above average is the uh, other, west of the continental divide, especially the green and the upper bear, and as well as the snake, looking at uh, below to well below average uh, forecast runoff volumes. Um, and also the majority of the plat 
and the little snake basins as well. There are some pockets of uh, near normal uh, uh, stream flow volumes on the uh, Laramie. And also there is one on uh, the tributary to the uh, lower North Platte, the Laprell Creek, uh, due to the snowpack that we had in uh, uh, mid-March and it's carried on into uh, most of the spring. As, as was mentioned, it is pretty much melted out uh, as of the mid to late to May timeframe here. Um, again, uh, just to caveat, these are uh, our full natural flows. Um, let me go, go back to the next previous slide. Uh, these are represent full natural flows and do not take into account diversions due to irrigation and other water management practices. So, um, but all right, next one, please. And then uh, this is the runoff as working for the weather service, worked the peak flows, continued on with working for the NRCS. Uh, this is the peak flows, snow melt uh, forecast for the, the rest of the runoff. Um, and the only areas to look at really, again, the uh, tongue and the uh, powder watersheds, looks like they have the, have the highest potential for uh, or any kind of really low elevation flooding, if you want to call it. Uh, rest of the state uh, with those peak flow numbers, uh, very low potential for any kind of flooding during the runoff season. So, again, these are snow melt only. Again, you're going to have higher, higher flows and higher potential for flooding if we get a higher, uh, especially a rain on snow melt event, or if it warms up drastically during the uh, rest of the runoff period. So. Are there any questions? Thanks, Jim. Uh, next up is uh, Anthony Schultz with the Wyoming State Forestry Division to look at the wildfire outlook. Hey everyone, thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> this is my uh, first slide here. I, we've already gone into detail on a lot of this, so uh, I'll try not to rehash. Um, specifically, I'll focus a little bit on green up, how we handle green up, um, this time of year as a wild and fire community and then get into kind of uh, long-term forecasting what that means for us operationally uh, for this upcoming 2021 fire season. So uh, as far as green up goes, uh, we normally start seeing it if, you know, around this time uh, into uh, mid-June. And that's when we normally rule of thumb start seeing a little bit of wildfire occurrence through late June and into early July. Um, how we as a wild and fire community determine green up um, it's not scientific at all. Um, it's a bunch of fire management officers um, around the state who work for the U.S. Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, uh, the states, and maybe a few, a few local county fire wardens kind of get together and say, should we green this up or not? And what that means is we're looking at any kind of RAS, those remote access weather stations that we utilize um, to start tracking that data. And so that officially begins um, the air quote, green up season for wildland fire. Um, I know there were some experimental tools working out of the Missoula Fire Sciences Lab in Missoula, uh, looking at how to bring maybe a little bit more uh, consistency to that process. But right now it's phone calls around the state. Is it green in your neck of the woods, Jay? Yep, looks green to me. Now well, it's green here in Cheyenne. So that's kind of how that works. Um, not great, not very scientific, but that's just kind of how we work it. Um, that being said, if you want to uh, slip to my next slide here, uh, what does that mean for the upcoming wildfire season uh, with all the information that Jared and company have shared uh, the last couple slides? Well, um, it, southwestern Wyoming is looking to have uh, above average uh, potential for wildland fires headed into to July. That's really when we start seeing um, again, rule of thumb, painting with a broad brush, our uh, wild and fire risks start to increase within the state, uh, especially as far as occurrence goes. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, into August, uh, as fire season moves north, along with uh, the warmer, drier weather patterns and things, um, you're going to see uh, higher than average potential um, really centered in uh, Region 4 of the U.S. Forest Service, uh, the Bridger Tetons to be specific. And I wouldn't be surprised to see some uh, higher fire activity on the Shoshone National Forest, Togedee Pass, that, that kind of area. Uh, that being said, you know, we already have seen, um, and you've seen some of those drought monitor uh, maps in the last few slides, 
but we've already seen higher than normal occurrence in the northeastern part, portion of the state. Uh, more specifically, our partners to the east in uh, South Dakota uh, have already had a, a, what we call an FMAG fire or a fire management assistance grant, meaning FEMA gave um, the state of South Dakota money to assist with some of their fires. A uh, few hundred people evacuated, um, the closure of a couple national parks, uh, that sort of thing. And that's really, really, really early, especially for those folks um, out that way to be having that kind of fire activity. Uh, so I would look for the northeastern portion um, in conjunction with just the percent of average uh, precipitation at this point, along with some of the uh, drought indices going on in the Crook and Weston County uh, area uh, to have quite a bit of heavy fire load as well this season. Um, the last time we've experienced um, really a true fire season in that neck of the woods would have been about 2016. So uh, we're about due for Northeast Wyoming as well. Uh, that being said, all this climate data is great information um, and we can talk about it uh, to our blue in the face. However, uh, what we do need in addition to the conditions or those actual fire starts for fires to occur. So um, in the wildland community, um, at least at the management level, we're really interested to see how um, COVID and the effects of folks being cooped up and now a potential increase um, in recreation in some of these areas, how that's gonna impact fire season, right? Just because there's not red on the map doesn't mean that we can't have large fire um, in, in those areas. And just because there is red on the map doesn't mean that we are going to have um, large fires either. That All that means is the conditions are prime. We still need those, still need those um, ignitions. And in Wyoming, uh, last year we were at 84% of all wildland fires uh, were human caused. Uh, that's tourism, that's folks that live here, that's non-observation uh, of fire restrictions, uh, all that good stuff combined, about 84% of all of our fires were human caused um, last year. So uh, it'll be really interesting to see um, how that climate data meshes with folks getting back out um, and recreating on public lands and how that translates to a higher or lower uh, fire load this uh, going into this 2021 fire season. Um, so uh, what we do to prepare for all of that, we've got um, the state of Wyoming. Um, we, had, we do have one helicopter based out of uh, Casper. We've got uh, two single engine air tankers or seats uh, based out of Casper as well. Um, and those will be available, of course, for call for local fire departments or uh, really any agency experiencing uh, wildfire currents um, about mid-June is when those contracts will start. So um, that's really the uh, what we're paying attention to here in Wyoming, at least for now, um, for uh, the wildfire look for 2021. Thanks, Anthony. And now Wendy Kelly with uh, USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub and UW Extension will wrap us up with how to get involved. Great, thank you, Tony. So as Tony mentioned, I'm gonna just talk briefly about how we can get involved, each of us, um, taking another quick look at the US Drought Monitor, which Tony kicked off the webinar, um, noting that we've seen some improvements kind of in the north central part of the state, as well as southeast corner of the state, but we've seen some degradation in the southwest portion of the state. And there's different ways that you can help us get a feel for what's going on out on the ground. And it's through two different opportunities through citizen science. So the first opportunity that you have is to become a COCORAS volunteer, which is reporting precipitation or lack of um, at your location, whether if it's your house or your office. You can see on um, the left side of the, the screen is the reporting for today um, throughout Wyoming at different stations where there was some precipitation or not. Um, and then on the right hand side are the active stations throughout Wyoming. You can learn more at the website that's towards the top right corner of the screen. Or you can reach out to Tony Bergantino who's on the webinar today or myself if you want more information or to get a, a rain gauge, but it's a, a great way to help fill in um, the map, so to speak, on uh, precipitation and what is falling out on the ground. The second opportunity I want to mention is the Condition Monitoring Observer Report System. There's a bit.ly link on the screen, kind of upper left-hand corner that you can go to. 
And this is where you can report conditions, everything from severely dry to severely wet and to help us understand what's going on out on the ground and impacts associated. I usually update the slide to show the different reports in Wyoming. However, unfortunately, the system has been down, um, so you're not able to currently report to it. Um, if you do have a condition or an impact that you want to report, uh, if, it's, if the system um, continues to be down for the next couple of days, feel free to email those to uh, Tony, myself, um, and we'll ensure that we take a look at those um, and can pass them along. This is the national system, this condition monitoring observer reports for reporting impacts in Wyoming for the Wyoming team, as well as the national team um, for the US drought monitor to look at. So it's a good way to communicate and it can relate to crops, livestock, um, you know, wildlife as well as um, household, other conditions and impacts. And you can see that at the top of the screen. On the next slide, you'll see just a couple of things to be aware of with the Seymour system. One is that regardless of conditions, I encourage you to submit a report, um, ideally monthly, whether if it's the first of the month or the 15th of the month, just to kind of help us keep a pulse on what's going on out on the ground. Uh, the second thing I wanna mention is that Pictures are worth a thousand words and comparison pictures are even more valuable for us. So if you want to share a picture to show how bad or um, whether it's really wet or really dry things are out on the ground, if you could have a comparison to a more normal year to demonstrate because we're not familiar with a pasture or a reservoir that you are. Um, so again, comparison photos are really important and if the system is not working for you, check your web browser or try it in another web browser. Um, I have heard reports that it, the Seymour system is not as uh, friendly to some web browsers. So with that, go ahead and advance us to the last slide, Tony. I do wanna thank all of our presenters today. Again, we have with us from the USDA, USDA NRCS, Jim Fahey. I'm with the USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub. We have from the National Weather Service, Jared Allen, and with the USGS, we have uh, Brian Loving with us today. And Tony Bergantino is with the Water Resources Data System as well as the State Climate Office. We also have Anthony Schultz with the um, Wyoming State Forestry Division. And I wear a second hat, which is with the University of Wyoming Extension. Um, so if you wanna reach out to any of us after the webinar today, please feel free to do so. I also wanna make note again of the two opportunities for you to get involved and help us understand the conditions out on the ground, which is volunteering through Kokoraz, as well as the condition monitoring observer report system. So thank you for uh, joining us today and thank you to our presenters as well.